still a lot of mysteries around a lot of things that happened in this country. In the night, up came a person who was wearing a cloak and he had in his hands the great seal of the United States. Jefferson, of course, looked at it and said, this is it. It's a very dangerous thing to reveal the truth, but we have to. Let's go back to really important individuals here. His name is Nicholas Rorick. The truncated pyramid uh, with the all-seeing eye on the top. Nicholas Rorick is the person who is responsible for that ending up on the dollar bill. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was the President of the United States, and Henry Wallace was the, the Secretary of Agriculture. Now, Henry Wallace was deeply involved in the occult. Rorick, to Wallace, to FDR, to the dollar bill. I was initiated into this very ancient order. Here we are at the Nicholas Rorick Museum. Do you really think it has anything to do with the Illuminati? The owl is the totem symbol of the Illuminati. Yes, because Rorick was the Illuminati. They all seem to have been Masons. His son was murdered. Those who normally get out, they're killed. Hexagrams are used during occult ceremonies when you're summoning up demons. Because we're dealing with Lucifer. And the all-seeing eye of God is one of the emblems that the Freemasons use. He said, are you trying to say that masonry is evil? I said, it comes right out of the same pit of hell. Didn't win a lot of friends that day. Our history of the dollar bill is a strange telling. One that involves an American president a former vice president, a mysterious Russian mystic, and a determined Jewish researcher on the trail of an ancient artifact that is said to have been in the possession of the most powerful rulers in history and somehow directly influenced the design of the dollar bill. As incredible as it seems, it's believed this mysterious object could mark the beginning of Armageddon. There's going to be a bloodbath there. With them is an expert in the signs and symbols of the occult world. This is not the eagle. Who claims that the details of the dollar bill are no accident, but represent the diabolical working of secret societies. This is the eye of a phoenix looking on in favor of the secrets of the dollar bill. Most debates about the design of the dollar bill usually involve the founding fathers of America. But it's important to remember that they only designed a great seal. There are many details to the dollar bill that go far beyond the seal itself. The great seal was developed through three committees involving a total of 14 men. But in the end, the work was submitted in June of 1782 by essentially one man, Charles Thompson. What is little known is that while Thompson presented a preliminary sketch, his final design was submitted to Congress only in the form of a written description. Looking at the rough drawings Thompson put together with artist William Barton, it becomes clear that many of the specific details of the seal as we know it today were added later on. For example, Above the head of the American Eagle are 13 stars that form a six-pointed hexagram. While Thompson's description called for the 13 stars, their hexagram formation was not part of his original description and is not present in the earliest realizations of the design. The hexagram seems to have been added in the 20th century. The nature of the Great Seal is so mysterious that some believe that it came from a supernatural force. An account recorded by Dr. Robert Hieronymus in his book, Founding Fathers Secret Societies, says that the Great Seal was given to Thomas Jefferson by a mysterious cloaked figure. I love that story. The Founding Fathers were trying to get the Great Seal of the United States designed. I mean, they needed 
to have a design for the great seal to represent our nation. And Jefferson went outside in the night and up came a person, an individual who was wearing a cloak whom he couldn't totally see and he had in his hands the great seal of the United States. And he basically said, or this being said, you know, you're struggling over the symbol for our nation. Here it is. The account reads that Jefferson told a strange story. A man approached him wearing a black cloak that practically covered him face and all and told him that he, the strange visitor, knew they were trying to devise a seal and that he had a design which was appropriate and meaningful. Jefferson, of course, looked at it, according to this story, and, and said, this is it. This is it. I, he knew it was it, and it was right. So he supposedly came running back into whatever, whether it was a tent or whatever it was, and he showed it to uh, other individuals, and he told them about they met this, this person outside. Of course, they went outside to go to find the guy, and he's gone. He, the, you know, so supposedly, we'll never find out who designed the Great Seal of the United States. While Dr. Hieronymus admits that he is skeptical about such stories, there are others who claim to believe them to this day. Perhaps it has something to do with John Adams, who was on the first SEAL committee with Thomas Jefferson. According to the written account, John Adams was there when this bizarre event took place. Oddly enough, the Adams Memorial in Washington, D.C. is adorned with this mysterious cloaked figure. Perhaps it's just a coincidence. The first historical account of the Great Seal's design was written by a 19th century American Army officer named Charles A. L. Totten. In his book on the secret symbols of the dollar bill, Masonic author David Oveson writes that Totten equated the birth of the United States with the beginnings of what he called the New Atlantis, a title given to a work by Sir Francis Bacon one of the mysterious financial backers of the Virginia colony. Oveson goes on to write that the Great Seal and the Dollar Bill represent the most extraordinary example in history of the public evolution of a magical design. Even as Sir Francis Bacon and his contemporary Dr. John Dee were said to be in contact with the spirit realm, there are those who believe that it is this dimension that has been guiding the course of America and the so-called evolution of the dollar bill. Debates have gone on for years about the secret symbolism of the Great Seal of the United States, whether or not these symbols represent secret societies, or if they are what the White House and the U.S. Congress currently tell us, symbols of divine providence, of stability, and the patriotism of America. What the Founding Fathers intended as they designed and ultimately approved of the Great Seal remains mostly a mystery. There's still a lot of mysteries around a lot of things that happened in this country. It's not, not in our history books. There can be no doubt that those things hidden in the shadows of the last two centuries are not easily brought to light. But when one comes into the modern era, into the age of photography, film, and the advanced practices of mass media, it becomes a bit easier to document world events and the intentions of those who have helped to shape them. In the late 19th century, Harvard professor Charles Eliot Norton referred to the Great Seal as a dull emblem of the Masonic fraternity. This idea was furthered by occult philosopher Manley P. Hall in the early part of the 20th century. Hall not only believed that the Great Seal was Masonic, 
but that it was created through the collective consciousness of the occult societies and represented the secret destiny that they had in mind for America. I'd say that he saw the secret destiny of America as the beginning of a world democracy and that this was a kind of um, an experiment in democracy that had been envisioned for thousands of years before. So he saw this much like Francis Bacon envisioned what he called the New Atlantis. In 1926, Hall began publishing a newspaper called The All-Seeing Eye, dedicated to his occult views of philosophy. It was during Hall's era that the all-seeing eye of the Great Seal would be taken out of obscurity and placed on the back of the dollar bill by President Franklin D. Roosevelt in 1935. This might all be seen as just a coincidence, if not for the fact that FDR seemed to be familiar with Hall's teachings on the occult. Today, Hall's legacy is carried on at the Philosophical Research Society in Los Angeles, California. A society that Hall founded in 1934, just one year before the Great Seal found its way onto the back of the dollar bill. The current president of Hall Society is Dr. Obadiah Harris, shown here in what is called the Wisdom Library at PRS. According to their website, the library is made up of writings that deal with divination, tarot cards, Kabbalah, alchemy, astrology, metaphysics, Buddhism, theosophy, and secret societies. And wisdom literature is about relationships uh, not only to each other, but, but to nature, to the universe. That's what this library is. This library is a library about the wisdom that is in nature and in uh, your in relationships and how it is that you can tap into that wisdom in any culture. It all overlaps. And Mr. Hall felt like that was really the future for the human race. Like Hall, Dr. Harris believes in the destiny of America. Even more interesting is that Dr. Harris's own writing on the subject was unofficially acknowledged by an important figure in FDR's White House. I, uh, I wrote a little book one time, one of my first books that I wrote was The Reawakening of the Americas. So we usually lose sight of the fact that the whole continent and I, I got a little one cent postcard from Eleanor Roosevelt thanking me for that. I, I carried that around for years because I thought that was a, a great compliment. But even more important was the familiarity that President Franklin Roosevelt had with the arcane literature in Manley Hall's so-called Wisdom Library a collection of occult books that Hall had gathered from all over the world. And Mr. Roosevelt himself, as you know, back in 1942, after the Pearl Harbor invasion, sent some of his people here to, to microfiche uh, the works of the, in this library because he looked upon it as a national treasure. He wanted to preserve it. And, uh, I was surprised that when I first heard that just how much he seemed to know about such a treasure of wisdom that is contained here. FDR's interest in the arcane and mystical was further reflected in the relationship he had with his Secretary of Agriculture, Henry Asgard Wallace. And so it was then in 1935 uh, when Franklin Delano Roosevelt was the President of the United States. And Henry Wallace was the Secretary of Agriculture. Now, Henry Wallace was deeply involved in the occult. Wallace's interest in mysticism was well known in circles around Washington, D.C., but it was something that would eventually damage his career in American politics. H.L. Mencken dubbed Wallace the Swami, 
while it was also said of him that he was the only cabinet member who dabbled in the occult and who could cast a horoscope. In spite of all this, FDR ardently defended him. According to one account, when one of FDR's close advisors worried that many people considered Wallace a mystic, Roosevelt snapped, he's not a mystic, he's a philosopher, he's got ideas, he thinks right, he'll help people think. But the question was, who was helping Wallace think? This question has been deemed critical because it was Henry Wallace who suggested to FDR that the Great Seal be placed on the back of the dollar bill. But why? Well, it has a lot to do. Let's go back to really important individuals here. His name is Nicholas Rorick. Nicholas Rorick um, was a very um, advanced spiritual soul with considerable vision. Nicholas Rorick was also a Rosicrucian. He was also a member of other secret societies. Rorick was a Russian painter and mystic who was deeply involved in theosophy and the teachings of Madame H.P. Blavatsky. He is famous for his travels into Tibet and the Far East in search of the legendary kingdom of Shambhala. But what was his relationship to FDR's Secretary of Agriculture? I believe that Nicholas Work was a spiritual teacher, not a supreme spiritual teacher, but was a teacher of Henry Asgard Wallace. Rorick was considered not only a teacher, but a spiritual mentor and guru to Henry Wallace. It's believed that Wallace recommended the Great Seal to FDR because of the mystical influence Rorick held over him. The dollar bill was approved with the all-seeing eye and the, uh, the truncated pyramid uh, with the all-seeing eye on the top of the... Um, because of uh, Nicholas Rorick. In the book, Tournament of Shadows, the authors document much of the activities and influence of Rorick during this period. They write that Rorick's influence was suspected in the adornment of the one dollar bill with a verso of the Great Seal showing a pyramid crowned by an all-seeing eye. The story of Wallace's role with FDR is told by the State Department in an official history called The Eagle and the Shield, a history of the Great Seal of the United States. Henry Wallace, while sitting in the State Department, found a booklet on the Great Seal of the United States. Wallace recollects that day in letters he wrote in 1951 and in 1955. He says, Turning to page 53, I noted the colored reproduction of the reverse side of the seal. The Latin phrase, Novus Ordo Seclorum, impressed me as meaning the New Deal of the Ages. If in terms of the dollar, if there's a code uh, about uh, the New World Order, um, I think that they jumped a few decades from the New Deal, because the, the, the Novus Ordum Seculorum can be translated to the New Deal in English as easily and readily as to the New Order or the New World Order. Initially, Wallace envisioned the Great Seal appearing on a coin. He took the idea to President Roosevelt. So when Henry Wallace saw this booklet and saw this pyramid in the Iron Triangle, he was a Freemason. He was a member of a secret society. Immediately he said, whoa, what a symbol to have uh, and not use. Let's use this. So it was he that went to uh, the president, FDR, and FDR, being a Freemason, looked at those symbols and said, hey, yes, wow, this is, you know, this is, uh, that's the uh, new order of the ages. What's the new deal? He used, he actually thought to a degree that the uh, new Nova Soda Saturn was the new deal. Wallace wrote that Roosevelt, as he looked at the colored reproduction of the seal, was first struck with the all-seeing eye, a Masonic representation of the great architect of the universe. Next, he was impressed with the idea that the foundation for the new order of the ages had been laid in 1776, but that it would be completed 
only under the eye of the great architect. Roosevelt, like myself, was a 32nd degree Mason. He suggested that the seal be put on the dollar bill rather than a coin and took the matter up with the Secretary of the Treasury. The Secretary of the Treasury at the time was Henry Morgenthau. And he uh, talked to Henry Morgenthau, who was the Secretary of the Treasury, and got him convinced that we should put this esoteric emblem uh, from the back of the uh, Great Seal of the United States onto the back of the dollar bill. This really symbolized the fact that now the esoteric influence dominated the American government. And, and Morgenthau, uh, the Secretary of Treasury, uh, wrote extensively about this point, and he said there's some strange cabal, some mystical order behind the scenes, uh, uh, you know, calling shots on on the on the uh, artwork uh, that appears now on our dollar bills. He had to approve it, and he later had found out that that uh, that this was all Henry Wallace's. It was all based on Henry Wallace's relationship to Nicholas Rorick. Nicholas Rorick is the person who. Uh, is responsible for that ending up on the dollar bill. Today, the story of Rorick's mystical influence is told by a variety of occult researchers. You know, the dollar bill thing was about the New World Order. Actually, that came from Franklin D. Roosevelt and, uh, and others around him, even um, Nicholas uh, Rorick. It's almost like baseball. Rorick to Wallace to FDR to the dollar bill. While many people have never heard of Rorick, he was a well-known figure during the FDR era in the years preceding World War II. His works of art were internationally recognized, so much so that an entire building in New York was erected to house his many paintings. Rorick was nominated three times for the Nobel Peace Prize and was the inspiration for the Rorick Peace Pact, which was signed by Henry Wallace in the presence of President Roosevelt at the White House. In 1986, Mikhail Gorbachev called Rorick one of the cultural pillars of Russia. The Russian cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin, the first man in outer space, when asked what the Earth looked like from orbit, answered, very much like the paintings of Nicholas Rorick. He was a great oil painter, uh, bar none. He, he's one of the greatest in terms of the Himalayan Altai uh, uh, scenes that he depicted. He, he did some wonderful work. He was a gifted uh, artist. But Rorick's story is one of success and disgrace as he eventually fell out of favor with his greatest supporters and at one point was suspected by the Soviets, the Japanese, and the United States of being a spy. Information was coming out that Rourke may have been used as a spy when he went into uh, these other nations uh, in, in the Far East. And with that, that's what broke the link between Henry Wallace and Nicholas Rourke to learn more about this mysterious figure and his influence on the dollar bill, we travel to the Rorick Museum in New York, along with cipher expert and international code breaker, Buff Perry, who has long been associated with the museum and its curators. Here we are at the Nicholas Rorick Museum, at 319 West 107th Street, almost at the corner of Riverside Drive. His paintings hang on, on the walls of three floors of this building and also many of the treasured uh, archives, letters and other writings and memorabilia of the Rorick family are housed here. I have a deep interest in the history of uh, Nicholas Rorick and his family and their association with a long lost artifact that I have had a lot to do with over the years. We'll learn more about this artifact later on as it ties together Nicholas Rorick with Henry Wallace, Manley P. Hall, and what some believe will be the future destiny of America.
like many who are involved in New Age and occult ideas. Nicholas Rorick dreamed of a united one world order. Nicholas Rorick is seen as uh, one of the key individuals, historical individuals, that uh, had a lot to do with the development of the League of Nations and subsequently the United Nations and is recognized as such in, in, uh, in the United Nations building. I'm told I haven't seen such commemoration, but I'm told it's there. Um, and the history of the United Nations is, is uh, often characterized uh, in association with Nicholas Rorick's uh, global peace efforts. Rorick's dream was shared by his disciple, Henry Wallace, as demonstrated by the book, Henry A. Wallace, His Search for a New World Order. This concept is visualized by the cracked bronze globe that sits outside the United Nations building, where a new world is literally breaking forth from the old. But somehow, Rorick's ideas on the subject would get him into trouble with Wallace when he traveled abroad on behalf of the United States government. In the book, Tournament of Shadows, we read that Rorick had been chosen by Henry Wallace to scour Central Asia for drought-resistant grasses to combat the Dust Bowl. This was the genesis of the Rorick expedition, financed and staffed by the Department of Agriculture. But during his two-year expedition, Rorick seemed to be on a mystical journey, one that involved his quest for the legendary city of Shambhala and literally searching for signs of the second coming of Christ. Nicholas Rorick's idea was that the second coming of Christ was, may happen within years. And that's why he visited uh, in, in, uh, India, China, etc., and, and Russia, and digging up and trying to locate uh, spiritual centers and spiritual information along those lines. Authors Meyer and Bryzak write that the search for Shambhala, which he identified with the second coming of Christ and the Maitreya, or Buddha to come, obsessed Rorik. His paintings and writings thereafter conjured up his vision of a new age of peace, brotherhood, and enlightenment. But Rorik's concept of Christ, shown here in one of his paintings, was dramatically different from that of traditional Christianity. Both Rorik and Wallace were members of the Theosophical Society that was founded by Madame H.P. Blavatsky in the late 19th century. Blavatsky's view of religion can be summed up in her book, The Secret Doctrine. She makes use of the phrase, demon est deus in versus, which means the devil is God inverted. Her view was based on the ancient Gnostic belief that in the Garden of Eden, the serpent who tempted the woman was really an angel of light. And that God, who had created Adam and Eve, was really the devil. The reason is because God had forbidden man from partaking of the tree of knowledge or gnosis. This is the origin of the term Gnostic or Gnosticism. Blavatsky further argued that Jesus was only one Messiah among many, like Buddha, Krishna, and Muhammad, and that the fifth Buddha, also called the Maitreya, is the last Messiah who will come. She says he will appear as Maitreya Buddha, the last of the avatars, or way showers. This belief and expectation are universal throughout the East. This is the event that is said to have consumed Nicholas Rorick and that he would have taught to his devoted disciple, Henry Wallace. The proof of their bizarre relationship was more fully revealed in a series of letters penned by Wallace to Nicholas Rorick. Newsweek with Westbrook, Pegler and others made a very big um, story out of what they called the guru letters, the letters that Henry Wallace would send to uh, uh, Nicholas Rourke, which obviously uh, he considered him a spiritual teacher from that standpoint. Wallace had gone from being Secretary of Agriculture to FDR's Vice President. Though his falling out with Rorick had happened some years earlier, 
the guru letters would surface once he decided to run for president. They had been obtained by a cantankerous news columnist, Westbrook Pegler, through an unidentified source. Pegler, along with H.L. Mencken, questioned Wallace in a news conference about the letters. But he was, at best, evasive and refused to answer their questions in a direct manner. The letters were signed H.A.W., assumed to be Henry Asgard Wallace. In one of the letters, Wallace allegedly wrote of curing his headaches at formal dinners by rubbing his forehead with a Tibetan amulet. In another letter, he said to Rorick, I have been thinking of you holding the casket, the sacred, most precious casket, and I have thought of the new country going forth, and I have thought of the admonition, await the stone, the sign of Shambhala. There's these letters, and they, and they indicate very strongly, no matter how you want to interpret them, that he was his teacher. Wallace went on to say, we await the stone, and we welcome you again to this glorious land of destiny. The stone he's referring to is the artifact that cipher expert Buff Perry has been following for many years now. We learned about this mysterious stone during our first interview with Perry at Manley Hall's Philosophical Research Society, where a statuette of Nicholas Rorick holding a casket, like the one described by Wallace, sits on one of the tables in the library. It was first mentioned to us by Dr. Obadiah Harris. Now, so, uh, Dr. Harris, can you tell us about this uh, the statue here? Oh, well, this would, this, this, would be a, this would be a very favorite thing to, to Manny Hall. This is Nicholas Rorick, who lived in the early part of... Um, well, actually, he lived even in the 20th century up until 1947. There, there's a Rourke Museum in New York, and this, of course, is of Mr. Rourke himself. Then, then there's, there's this little casket, and in this casket symbolizes uh, what he was given, which is the foundation stone of America. And uh, we don't know where that stone is today. Uh, I think that... Um, um, Buff Perry knows a little more about where it might be now. We then asked Buff Perry to explain the stone in relation to the statue of Nicholas Rorick. The statue is based on a painting his wife Helena painted of him. The casket he's holding with, with a, a, uh, a cloth fabric, a kind of sacred appearing to be Tibetan cloth fabric over it, um, is a casket that contains a stone, a stone that variously has been called the Chintamani in Sanskrit, meaning the stone of wisdom, uh, the Bethel or Bethel stone, which was Jacob's pillow stone uh, that you read about in Torah in, in the Old Testament, um, which became known as a Bethel stone uh, because it was uh, used at the location of what became the town of Bethel, so Bethel. So, this stone um, has a, an incredible history to it that has only recently really surfaced uh, in terms of how it ended up in the hands of Nicholas Rorick, where it came from. There can be no question that this stone in the casket consumed Rorick through the latter part of his life. His paintings are filled with the repeated imagery of it and here you have a man delivering that casket up again. It appears in, you know, it seems like almost all of Rorick's paintings. These are uh, supposed to be his family and ascendant masters uh, carrying the Rothenberg casket in which that stone was kept. Rorick called the stone the treasure of the world even his wife, Helena, is pictured in this portrait, which hangs in the Rorick Museum, with the casket resting next to her, something she and her husband had received under mysterious circumstances in 1923. Everything changed once they received this. 
But why would this artifact be of interest to FDR's vice president, Henry Wallace? And how could it relate to the design of the Great Seal on the dollar bill? As Buff mentioned earlier, the stone is said to be the pillow stone of Jacob, upon which he had his dream of a ladder that stretched from earth to heaven, with the angels of God ascending and descending on it. The ladder itself is a recurring symbol in secret societies, especially Freemasonry. Master Mason Albert Pike wrote extensively of Jacob's Ladder in his book, Morals and Dogma, and even suggests that Jacob's Ladder may in fact have been a pyramid. The book of Genesis tells us that when Jacob awoke from his dream, he took the stone and set it up for a pillar, and he said, This stone, which I have set for a pillar, shall be God's house. As a result, some have come to believe that God, or the power of God, resides in the stone itself. From there, the legends vary, but one account says that the prophet Jeremiah took the stone and carried it into Scotland where eventually the Scottish kings were crowned upon it. In late March 1506, Robert the Bruce was enthroned as King of Scots at Schoon in Perthshire. An old Scottish poem says, Except old seers do feign and wizard wits be blind, the Scots in place must reign where they this stone shall find. Eventually, the stone was kept at Scone Palace and was hence called the Stone of Scone. To this day, the Scots also call it the Stone of Destiny. In the year 1296, King Edward I of England captured the stone and it was taken to Westminster Abbey for the crowning of English monarchs. In this picture, you can see the stone itself in the compartment beneath the coronation chair, a chair that was specifically built to house the Stone of Destiny. The last monarch to be crowned upon it was Queen Elizabeth II in 1953. But in 1997, the English supposedly returned the ancient stone to the Scots, with the understanding that the future monarchs of England would continue to be crowned upon it. Today, the stone is said to be housed inside Edinburgh Castle in Scotland. There is even a self-guided tour where visitors can view the Stone of Destiny along with the honors of Scotland, the crown jewels of Scottish royalty. According to the tour guide we spoke with while there, this is the legendary stone. But if this is true, then how could the stone have ended up inside a casket in the hands of Nicholas Rorick? The answer given by Buff Perry and others, is that the stone currently at Edinburgh is a fake. Uh, the stone of scone, because uh, the, the one that's actually in Edinburgh Castle is a fake, and most Scots know it, because once the English came and stole it once, they were never going to be stolen again. <laughs> so the one that's actually in the castle is not real. Others, like Alex Ammond, the first minister of Scotland, claimed that the stone taken by the English king in 1296 was a fake, and that the real stone was somehow hidden away secretly by the Scots. Exactly where the real stone of destiny is today, and how it may have changed hands over the centuries, continues to be a matter of debate. Nevertheless, its importance is recognized by nearly all occult societies in the world today. It is the foundation stone of all history. It's also called the Philosopher's Stone. 
Um, it, it, ha it has met the Lapis Exilis in the Grail uh, literature cycles that came out of Creighton and Detroit and, and uh, Wolfram von Eschenbach. Uh, it, Wolfram von Eschenbach writes in Parsifal that uh, the stone is called the Grail. While the Holy Grail is traditionally thought of as the Cup of Christ, those involved in secret societies believe that the original and oldest form of the Grail is the Stone of Destiny, written of by Wolfram von Eschenbach in his Grail legend, Parsifal. And he calls it Lapis Exilis, which is a, a way of saying the exiled or wandering stone. Uh, he does that uh, because of the history known in Freemasonry and in the secret societies of this stone's movement around here and there and where it would be would, would, would indicate the importance of that place. The stone mentioned in Eschenbach's Grail legend is a green stone that some believe is similar to a type of meteorite known as Moldavite. This description is said to have been confirmed by Nicholas Rorick while he claimed to have the stone in his possession. The secret societies believe that this stone that supposedly fell from heaven empowers that person or place of its location. Then it has to do with the secret history of America and why that stone arrived here, who brought it. As we showed earlier, Dr. Obadiah Harris referred to it as the foundation stone of America. What is the significance of the uh, foundation stone of America? Well, the foundation stone is really about, is about what America is about uh, and also what England seems to be about. And uh, so it's really, it implies the great mysteries that was contained in the great mystery schools and of those who had this vision. Was it this mystery school vision that guided FDR and his fellow Mason, Henry Wallace, as they set the all-seeing eye of the great architect on the back of the dollar bill? When one considers the repeated use of the word destiny by Manley Hall, who wrote of the secret destiny of America, along with FDR, who had knowledge of Hall's library, and who said that Americans had a rendezvous with destiny. And then Henry Wallace, who referred to America itself as the land of destiny. It only makes sense that such men would have taken an interest in the stone of destiny. That Henry Wallace had an interest in seeking the Holy Grail is proven by the letters he wrote to Nicholas Rorick. As a Freemason, he would have seen an occult connection with America. Since the Stone of Destiny is said to have come from heaven to earth, from the dog star Sirius. Known as the brightest star in the heavens, Sirius is an important key to understanding the stone and what the secret societies intend for the destiny of America. When the United States was founded, the architecture of Washington, D.C. was designed in alignment with the rising of Sirius in the east. July 4th, Independence Day, is the day when the sun is in conjunction with this star, said to be 23 times more powerful than the sun itself. Also consider that Sirius is the blazing star or pentagram used in Masonic lodges. But as this mystical symbol relates to the dollar bill, we read that the famous emblem of the all-seeing eye seen hovering above the unfinished pyramid is a depiction of the eye of Sirius and is a common motif found throughout Masonic lore. The importance of Sirius to the secret societies cannot be overstated. Some believe that the secrets of this star are a matter of life and death. In our last documentary, Riddles in Stone, Dr. Robert Hieronymus 
explained the importance of the Dog Star Sirius. This happened during a casual discussion, and some of what he said took us by surprise. Listen now to his uncut explanation to understand how critical the secrecy of this symbol is to Freemasonry and all the secret societies. And as you listen, remember, it is Sirius that rises in the east behind the sun, which stands as a picture of the twofold nature of every symbol in the occult. Interesting thing about all Freemasonry is, is symbolism is ultimately very important. They don't put a lodge in the east because it's a nice place and it looks good. They put it in lodge in the east. The masters have put it in the east so because it's the rising sun. It's the rising sun. You're catching the energies of the light, right. and 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 to them, they didn't believe that the sun was God. All right. Like we're told, the ancient Egyptians, that we're told all the time that they thought the sun was God. Well, to simplify it, um, do I have time to tell them this part? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. As with all secret societies, you have levels, and and if you're on the lower levels, you don't even know their upper levels. You don't even you don't even they don't even tell you. You bump into it by accident or someone comes along. Now, in Scottish Rite, that's something different, you know, because they know that there's a... But before then, and basically secret societies, such as, let's go to ancient Egypt. To the ancient Egyptians, the priest would tell the serfs, the guys that tilled the land, they would say, the sun is God, okay? And, and, and so the, they accepted that very um, low-level interpretation, all physical. That's not what the priests believed. What the priests believed, there was a second level. Um, the priests believed that, no, the physical sun is not the supreme being. It's the spirit which flows through the physical sun that is the supreme deity. However, there was another level. And the priests didn't even know it. It's those that were involved and, and, and elevated to... To, um, if I would have told you this 15 years ago, I might have gotten shot. But this is now, I'm so glad now that this is easy to talk about. Uh, the, the third level, which was the, which is a better, a higher level of understanding, said, nope, it's not, that's not the sun. The sun is not the supreme deity. Nope, yes, spiritual energies come through the sun. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is the star Sirius. The dog star. The dog star, because the dog star was everything to the ancient Egyptians with the rising of the Nile and the feeding of the people. And, and well, so... Ferguson says that Washington, D.C. was, uh, was you know, that the dog star was important in the founding of Washington, D.C. Uh, indeed it was, yes. And, 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 as, and that, that's a reflection on America, but the point I was just trying to make was that third level is never told. And with every group, every secret society I belong to over 15 or 16... I don't belong to any of them now. I can't. 15 to 16 different societies? Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, there was many. There were many different types. While Dr. Hieronymus's claims of belonging to more than a dozen secret societies might sound incredible, it is important to remember that he is the most highly recognized authority on the history of the Great Seal. I am a triangle on the pyramid. And he is closely associated with the leading Masonic apologist in America, Dr. S. Brent Morris. Now, you know, Bob Hieronymus, Dr. Bob, is the expert on the Great Seal. Because of this, we believe the insights of Dr. Hieronymus, not only into the Great Seal, but also on the importance of the Dog Star Sirius to secret societies, becomes that much more significant. Listen again to what he says about Sirius when we make mention of the book on the secret design of Washington, D.C. by Masonic author David Ovison. And so Ovison says that Washington, D.C. was, uh, was you know, that the Dog Star was important in the founding of Washington, D.C. Indeed it was, yes. And, 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 as, and that, that's a reflection on America. That's a reflection on America. How is Sirius a reflection on America according to the secret societies? And is it just a coincidence that the Stone of Destiny, awaited by an American vice president and supposedly in the possession of his guru, is said to have come from this blazing star? 
In the occult, this stone is not only a type of the Holy Grail, but seems to be a symbol for the secrets of masonry, as understood by Henry Wallace. In his book, The Occult Conspiracy, Michael Howard says of Wallace that, the Secretary of Agriculture was well versed in occult knowledge. In a letter to his Russian guru, he stated, the search, whether it be for the lost word of masonry, or the holy chalice, or the potentialities of the age to come, is the one supremely worthwhile objective. So may we strive for the chalice and the flame above it. Howard says the chalice he refers to is the Holy Grail, regarded by the Rosicrucians as a feminine symbol for perfection, and the age to come is the dawning of the Aquarian Age. The concept of the flaming chalice is another repeated theme in the paintings of Nicholas Rorick. And you can see this entity holding the chalice and there's a flame coming up from the middle of the cup part of the chalice. This is a painting of Prophet Muhammad and interestingly he's uh, viewing a specter of a person of some sort or other who's bearing in in the heart area the uh, chalice that's burning the flame that's that's consistent with Zoro Zoroastrian uh, uh, motifs as well as uh, Agni Yoga but when I was in in uh, in, uh, in in Isfahan for example and in Tehran I visited the Zoroastrian temples and there those uh, chalices that bear the flames are as big as I am and I'm sure that Nicholas Rorick had uh, the occasion to see those chalices in the Zoroastrian uh, temples in his journeys through through the East and the, and the Near East but this is definitely Muhammad he's named it Muhammad the Prophet but for some interesting reason uh, Muhammad is viewing some kind of spiritual entity with uh, that uh, fire-bearing chalice in the heart zone. While Rorick's paintings are today kept in a modest museum in Manhattan, they were once kept in a towering building on the Upper West Side. In the 1920s, Rorick was supported by a wealthy benefactor and Freemason named Louis Horch. Like Wallace, Hortz considered Rorick to be his guru and financed the construction of a massive building to honor him. It was called the Master Building. During this era, Rorick designed what he called a peace banner that went along with the Rorick Peace Pact that had been signed by Henry Wallace. The symbol was simply three circles in a triangle formation. This symbol can be seen even today, engraved on the black cornerstone of the master building. Buff Perry and others believe that certain arcane contents, including the Stone of Destiny, were placed inside this cornerstone when it was laid. This is the seal over the cornerstone of the master building that is at the corner of 103rd and Riverside Drive. And here you see 1929 and the three circles with, with an M and then an R uh, beneath it. And I believe that means Master Rorick, meaning Master Building in effect. He was like an edifice to people at that time. So the, the idea of the master building was the idea that Rorick himself was the master. Is that absolutely, correct? absolutely. The whole building was built for him, for his use, in his honor and in his name. And it was to be used as a, as a, a, a place where there would be art galleries, art studios, uh, great writers of, of the past uh, lived there. Joseph Campbell was there? Joseph Campbell lived there for a period of time. Joseph Campbell was a highly regarded esoteric 
who wrote about the power of myth. His works are still celebrated by the Theosophical Society to this day. Another 20th century luminary who frequented the master building was Manley P. Hall. Hall was clearly interested in Rorick and in his books wrote about the symbolism of the stone that is called the Grail. And uh, we don't know where that stone is today. Uh, I think that um, um, Buff Perry knows a little more about where it might be now, but some believe it's in the foundation stone of uh, the Rorick Building, the Rorick Museum there in New York. Mr. Hall used to go to the Rorick Museum in his early days, uh, just after he had written the big book called The Secret Teachings of All Ages. Because there in the, in the penthouse of the Rorick Building, uh, met the very elite, the esoteric elite you might say, who were really into not only the, the mysteries of, of the great world religions, but also the mysteries that many people don't know that was part of the motivation in the founding of our own country. While the master building today is used mainly for apartment living, the penthouse located in the upper levels is still there. Is it possible that Henry Wallace could have been one of those esoteric elite who met there with men like Manley Hall? There is at least one record of his meeting with Nicholas Rorick at the master building. American Heritage reports that Wallace visited the museum and was thrilled beyond measure to receive a brief audience with Rorick. He found the artist's appearance, demeanor, and plans to promote culture and peace extremely impressive. He admired Rorick's paintings because he said they gave him a smooth feeling inside. The article goes on to say that Wallace avidly read the painter's writings and frequently communicated with the officials of the Rorick Museum. Whether FDR himself ever attended the penthouse meetings is unknown, but it is reported that the president's mother was an admirer of Rorick and Roosevelt himself had once met and been favorably impressed by the artist. It is also worth noting that in 1932, First Lady-elect Eleanor Roosevelt gave a lecture at the Rorick Museum Lecture Hall. American Heritage writes, the State Department grew very nervous about Rorick, but he had influence in the Oval Office. With such connections, is it possible that inside the mysterious penthouse at the upper level of the master building, the so-called esoteric elite decided on the design for America's dollar bill. Remember that the master building was finished in 1929. The Great Seal was not placed on America's currency until six years later in 1935. All of the players in this drama were involved in masonry, including the Secretary of Treasury, Henry Morgenthau. When, when uh, Morgenthau, the Secretary of the Treasury, uh, regretted having placed the, uh, the all-seeing eye on the verso of, of the American dollar bill, he made reference to a small Kabbalistic group that used that symbol in their ceremonies and, and because of that regretted that that symbol ever would have uh, made it onto the dollar bill, which to me is rather peculiar because Masons for centuries had already uh, used uh, that all-seeing eye in their lodges, in their literature, and, you know, in all means and manner of expression. Perry's suggestion is that while Morgenthau, as a Mason, might not object to a Masonic symbol, he was concerned about the influence of what appeared to be a personality cult surrounding Nicholas Rorick. He was a little embarrassed that perhaps all of the information got out that Nicholas Rorick, the guru, um, would have been instrumental in uh, seeing to it that that symbol ended up on the dollar bill. We took a trip to the master building and met with the building's historiographer, Mildred Spicer. 
She lives inside one of the apartments with a view through the right-angled windows that are famous for being the first of their kind. Whether or not they were intended to represent the Pythagorean right triangle, a favorite symbol among Masons, is for the viewer to decide. Gorick's idea was to, uh, to have that Mason symbol put on the dollar bill so the whole, every resident in the U.S. is connected to uh, Rorick through the dollar bill. While we were there, Mildred confirmed that Rorick's chief financial supporter, Louis Horch, was in fact a 33rd degree Freemason. And that was given, uh, was uh, sent to me by Oreo. Uh, her father was Lewis Horch, and she and her mother, Nettie Horch, were very involved with the museum. And uh, during this time, they were caught up in the mysticism of uh, Rorick. And those who were part of Rorick's inner circle were invited to the highest level. With Mildred's help, we were able to make our way up the elevators and then the many stairs to the much talked about penthouse, which some have called a kind of temple or meditation room. There, is that where they had their meditation? No, the meditation was right back with you. We had that apartment and it was Behind this green door may well have been the place where Nicholas Rorick met with men like Manley Hall, Henry Wallace, and countless others to discuss America's secret destiny and quite probably the occult design of the Great Seal. The penthouse is currently used as an apartment and we were unable to see inside of it, but we followed Buff Perry onto the roof to get a look at the architecture from the exterior. We're at the very top of the master building, and uh, behind you is the river, and in front of you is the outside walling of the uh, meditation room or temple or whatever one wants to call it, the chapel that uh, Rorick had uh, constructed for his private spiritual purposes. So it's right on the other side of this yeah, wall. Yeah, it's all this in here. And that's the very top. The staggered layers at the top of the penthouse seem to bear some resemblance to one of Rorick's paintings titled Arhat. In Buddhism, Arhat is the highest level of enlightenment, said to be the ultimate goal of Nirvana. In Rorick's painting, notice the image of the Buddhist figure sitting inside the staggered stones, perhaps a symbol for the enlightened esoteric elite in the meditation room. The master building rooftop is undoubtedly interesting, especially since it overlooks the Cathedral Church of St. John the Divine, the largest cathedral in the world, where many of the occult concepts of America all seem to come together. What's interesting is that much of the cathedral was being built during FDR's administration. On the outside, there is a cross before what is called the Rose Window, an obvious symbol of Rosicrucianism. Inside the cathedral, we find praying saints alongside lurking demons. An image of what looks like a Zoroastrian Maitreya hangs upon a cross at the altar. Meanwhile, an upside down cross is seen in one of the alcoves serving as a monument to September 11th. Elsewhere, a phoenix bird is carved beneath the pulpit. A carving of George Washington is found next to that of William Shakespeare. And on the floor is the seal of St. Albans. St. Albans 
was one of the names given to Sir Francis Bacon. And in the midst of it, we find obvious imagery pertaining to the Holy Grail. Some more obvious than others, like this seal on the floor of the cathedral. But notice that there are two cups beneath the cross. Could this be suggestive of the two grail concept put forth by Wolfram von Eschenbach and others, who believe that the grail is both the cup of Christ and the stone of destiny? It is worth noting that grail legends were of great importance during the time of FDR and the whole World War II generation. Not only in America, but in Europe, Richard Wagner based his famous opera, Parsifal, on the writings of Wolfram von Eschenbach. This opera would become a central focus for Adolf Hitler. And as a result, there are some who have argued that Hitler's whole life was dedicated to the Holy Grail. Occult historian Tracy Twyman writes of what Hitler and other occultists believed about the Grail, that it dates long before the time of Christ, all the way back to ancient Atlantis. She writes that, just as Hermes possessed a magic stone, which has been associated with the Holy Grail, Hercules also possessed a heavenly stone and a special cup that he carried it in. According to Plato's dialogue, the pillars of Hercules were the gateway to Atlantis. This may be why Sir Francis Bacon used these same pillars as a symbol for achieving greater knowledge. Oddly enough, about the same time the Masons were finishing the work on the master building, Nicholas Rorick finished this painting titled The Last of Atlantis. Which brings us back to the greater mystery of the Rorick building and what may be the secret key to understanding the dollar bill. But first, how did the Stone of Destiny come into the possession of Nicholas Rorick? The receiving of this stone in the Roth Rothenberg casket uh, was very mysterious. Nobody's completely certain who sent it to him, um, but, but he and his wife Helena were in Paris in 1923. Uh, uh, in, a, in an exquisite suite when all of a sudden this was delivered and it was delivered in this box and the box says Sank Place Vendôme and that's that five Vendôme place which was where they were staying and it was sent from Bankers Trust from M.M. M. And it's addressed to Madame and Monsieur N. Rorick. And after many years, this is what has come of the Rothenberg casket that was in this pinewood box. But why would this artifact have been delivered to Nicholas Rorick? And could it have really ended up inside the cornerstone of the master building, as Buff Perry and others believe? When it was mysteriously delivered to, to Nicholas Rorick in 1923, he carries it around. He ends up going to India with it. Um, by 1929, he's, he's uh, had this huge building, a 29-story Art Deco building built for him in New York City by, by uh, Louis Horch, uh, an investment banker, with a cornerstone uh, uh, prepared to have this sacred casket bearing the stone and other artifacts sent from India, because he's now taking it in 1923 from Paris to India, and placed in the cornerstone for, for posterity. All of this might seem a bit too incredible, except for the fact that the laying of the cornerstone for the master building 
was a major event in 1929, attended by foreign dignitaries from around the world. From Spain, France, Poland, Australia, Romania, and a host of other countries. Why would they all turn out for this event? This 1929 event is very important. Albert Einstein sent a tribute, which I have a copy of, to, to, to the construction of the building, to the meaning of Nicholas Rorick, who he was, what he was doing for humanity, uh, uh, and, the, and, and why the laying of this cornerstone was so important. Uh, Rabindranath Tagore, many, many uh, luminaries and notables, uh, government officials and the like, including Henry Wallace, who became FDR's vice president first Secretary of Agriculture and then Vice President in the next decade. And that becomes very intriguing, uh, what, what all the connectedness is in terms of FDR, Freemasonry, and the stone. Just as Freemasons were involved with the designing of the dollar bill, they were also involved in the construction of the master building. As noted earlier, the master building was financed by Louis Horch, who was appointed to a number of government offices during FDR's administration. In fact, he was placed in charge of the Department of Commerce by his fellow Freemason and Rorick disciple, Henry Wallace. As we have seen, Wallace, in his letters, shared a fascination with the Stone of Destiny. And so the stone today is in this building? The stone is in this casket, said to be in this casket. They, the reports I have received from the Rorick Museum uh, would have that stone in this Rajput casket in the cornerstone of the master building. The interest of men like Albert Einstein, Henry Wallace, and not to mention all the foreign dignitaries becomes quite intriguing when one considers the full contents of the casket that was said to be placed inside the cornerstone. I'm familiar with the ingredients of the Rajput casket uh, by uh, having read letters from uh, Zina Fosdick and her own uh, notebook entries and also uh, because uh, Aida Toskaya him herself one of the co-curators of the Rorick Museum uh, wrote out what Zina Fostick had stated they had placed in the Rajput casket in Darjeeling before it was delivered to the city of New York to be placed in the cornerstone. As Buff Perry explained, the letter that describes the contents of the casket comes from Zina Fosdick, a longtime devoted disciple of Nicholas Rorick who would later become the director of the Rorick Museum. The museum photo collection is filled with images of Fosdick alongside Rorick while they were in Darjeeling, India, where the casket was prepared. As such, it stands to reason that she would have known the details of what they put inside. The letters written by Sina Fosdick, um, and it was actually uh, an entry in her diary and what's written here is an accounting of all of the ingredients that are in the Rajput casket that was prepared in Darjeeling, India um, in 1928 to be delivered to New York, to Manhattan uh, and to be placed in the cornerstone of the master building. And there are a lot of interesting things uh, that were placed in the in the Rajput casket. Uh, for example, an image of Maitreya printed on Tibetan paper. As we showed earlier, in the occult belief, the Maitreya is said to be the last messiah that will come. The Maitreya is seen as the final deliverer and incarnation in the Buddhist tradition. Again, he's also Kalki in the Hindu tradition, the tenth incarnation of Vishnu. Vishnu is the great god of, of Hinduism. 
So they're not mixing up Jesus with Maitreya, but they are seeing Maitreya as a messianic figure, a world messiah who would answer all of the expectations of all the world religions at one time. The reason Rorik would not mix up Jesus with Maitreya is because of the New Age belief that Maitreya is the true Christ, while Jesus was only his disciple. This is also the teaching of Scottish mystic Benjamin Krem. Maitreya embodies what we call the Christ principle, the Christ consciousness. And 2,000 years ago, he overshadowed his disciple, Jesus. Jesus was not the Christ except for three years. Over these three years, from the baptism to the crucifixion, Jesus was overshadowed by Maitreya. And when he spoke, sometimes it was Maitreya speaking, sometimes it was Jesus. We featured Krem in our last documentary, Riddles in Stone. He is the founder of Share International and has been declaring for more than 30 years that Maitreya would be arriving soon. Maitreya is standing by, ready to come into the world at any moment. When we spoke with Krem in 2006, he had just come from speaking to the United Nations. While I was in New York, I gave a talk at the United Nations and uh, there was a large group of, of, uh, of New York um, theosophists. Well, a certain number from outside the United Nations were allowed to come to the top. And they were very responsive, very responsive. These theosophists are modern members of the Theosophical Society, of which both Nicholas Rorick and Henry Wallace were members. Other famous members included Thomas Edison, and Mahatma Gandhi, as well as Gandhi's close friend, Jawaharlal Nehru, the first prime minister of India. Also pictured here, beside Nicholas Rorick. But in addition to the image of Maitreya, what were the rest of the contents buried inside the cornerstone of the master building? A portrait of M.M. Uh, this, I believe, is, is uh, is uh, Master uh, Moriah. Master Moriah was one of the names given to a spirit that is said to have inspired Madame H.P. Blavatsky. Rorick's wife, Helena, claimed that the same spirit was in contact with her and inspired her writings. It's Master Moriah, uh, who is actually Helena Rorick, channeling uh, this this, uh, this entity, if I, I can put it that way. One of her books was titled On Eastern Crossroads, in which she wrote extensively about the stone in her husband's possession, calling it the serpent stone, and saying, the stone cometh, and it is a most grievous error to deny the stone. In fact, the quote from one of Henry Wallace's guru letters about the new country that goes forth and the admonition to await the stone comes directly from this book. Nicholas Rorick tended more to write about, you know, sort of physical reality and the adventures in the Himalayan mountains in the Altai region of, uh, toward the Himalayan mountains, where his wife, Helena, wrote about the channeling and the esoterica, uh, the theosophical kind of side of things. While Rorick's writings may have dealt with reality, his paintings were anything but. Dedicated to universal archetypes, and with them, the promise of a sacred treasure. That brings us to the third, and perhaps most important, item placed inside the cornerstone of the Master Building. For all people who had varying kinds of relations with Nicholas Rorick, they were channelers, they were, they were followers, but of, to me, personally, greatest interest is, the, is this side uh, statement that uh, Aida Toskea, who was also one of the curators of the Rorick Museum, wrote, Sina omits a piece of the stone that was placed in the casket. This goes back to that famous 
stone that uh, the Rorix became a cause celeb because of, and many other people wrote about later. Everything changed once they received this. The 1924 marked a whole new direction for them all. And this came about, I think, in, yeah, this is 1924. You'll see the casket here is the same casket there. And this is a burning casket of some kind. Yeah, Tr Chintamani. Chintamani is a Sanskrit term that means the stone of wisdom, um, that he calls the treasure of the world. And that's how he depicted the treasure of the world, the ultimate treasure of the world. It seems only appropriate that this treasure hunt would take us back to Manley Hall's society in Los Angeles, and in particular to one of the graduates there, from the University of Philosophical Research, a Freemason named Gavin Wentz. On his website, he quotes a curious passage from Eschenbach's Grail legend with a clear reference to the Knights Templar. The passage reads, wherever these Templars receive victory or defeat, I will tell you by what they live. They live with a stone. If you do not know it by name, I will name it for you. It is called Lapsit Exilis. The stone is also called the Grail. Eschenbach's reference to the Knights Templar is curious. During the same period that he wrote his Grail legend, the Templar Church of Garway, England was built. Inside we find mysterious symbols carved above what appears to be the outline of a man. These carvings are said to be a depiction of the Holy Grail, the chalice shown here. In the midst of it is a traditional Catholic host with a cross in the center. But inside the chalice, just beneath the host, is what appears to be a truncated pyramid. Which brings us back to Gavin Wentz, who produced an award-winning documentary which he titled Lapis Exilis based on a variant spelling of the grail name given by von Eschenbach. This slight alteration to the original name had been recorded in the diary of Nicholas Rorick. And it seems to be a contraction of several words in, in the Eschenbach uh, example, but clearly in Rorick's example, Lapis Exilis means the the exiled stone or the wandering stone or the stone that comes in from somewhere else. The word lapis is simply Latin for the stone. But how was this stone envisioned by Rorick and his disciple Henry Wallace? Rorick described the stone as a type of moldavite, the meteoric stone of green or emerald color. This would seem to fit with the description given by von Eschenbach in the 12th century. On his website, dedicated to the stone's history, Freemason Gavin Wentz came to this conclusion about just what Nicholas Rorick envisioned as Lapis Exilis, the stone they call the Grail. Is it really possible that Rorick, Wallace, and even FDR believed the Great Seal was a representation of the Holy Grail? And if so, then, as the treasure of the world, would this explain why the U.S. dollar has been used from the time of FDR onward to send financial aid to nearly all the countries of the earth? for the establishment of a global society. During his 2008 presidential campaign, Barack Obama was criticized 
for wanting to spread the wealth. But in reality, the redistribution of wealth, a socialist tenet, is a practice that the United States has engaged in at a global level for more than half a century, beginning in the aftermath of World War II. We want peace and prosperity for the world as a whole. The United States now is conducting a new kind of foreign aid program. Aid not for destroyed industrial nations, but for developing countries with limited knowledge of modern technology. Many are just emerging from colonial status. American aid seeks to lay the foundations for industrial and agricultural growth. It is motivated by the humanitarian ideals of the American people and cold. But now that the economy of the American people has taken a turn, and it seems that the dollar is declining fast, how could this fit in to the plan of the secret societies? Consider that when the shock waves of the American stock market shook the world, France and China called for a global currency and a new world order. Which brings us to the other half of the dollar bill's design the American Eagle that some believe represents the mythical Phoenix, a bird that is said to destroy itself by fire. But according to Wolfram von Eschenbach, the power of the Phoenix lies in the stone of destiny. In Parsifal, he writes, by virtue of this stone, the Phoenix is burned to ashes in which she is reborn. Thus does the Phoenix molt her feathers after which she shines dazzling and bright and as lovely as before. If these ideas are truly embraced by secret societies, could this suggest the intentional destruction of the American dollar, which will then force our financial networks into a global economy, resulting in a new Atlantean empire that extends to all the earth? As Buff Perry mentioned earlier, the stone is also called the Chintamani Stone. As a symbol, the stone unites the occult traditions of both Eastern and Western mysticism. One thing is certain, those who practice the occult believe this artifact is the key to achieving the great work of all secret societies. Mark Amaru Pinkham is the co-director of a group called the International Order of Gnostic Templars. In his article titled, Nicholas Rorick and the Chintamani Stone, a Holy Grail from Sirius, he writes that data regarding the Chintamani Stone maintains that it was brought to earth by Syrian missionaries to eventually help precipitate a one world civilization. He says there is some indication that one part of the stone has been the sacred stone of the Kaaba, which has united millions of Muslims around the globe. Pinkham goes on to write that it is known that a portion of the Chintamani stone was given to the League of Nations, whose stated goals were the creation of a one world civilization. The association of the stone as a symbol of unity is an important part of how it is said to have come to America. It has to do with the secret history of America and why that stone arrived here, who brought it. Oddly enough, this mysterious artifact may provide the missing link to understanding how America has gone from being a Christian nation to a country beset with pagan statues, pagan monuments, and occult icons. For years, Buff Perry was financed by a leading member of the Philosophical Research Society to hunt down the Stone of Destiny. I learned about this stone going into Rorick's hands through the director of the Rosicrucian Order, the, the curator of the Rosicrucian Museum in San Jose, California. The whole concept of the stone as the Holy Grail represents the so-called perfecting of mankind. This is the theme of Rosicrucianism and Freemasonry. 
As Manley Hall writes, to the mystic, the stone is divine power, an ancient symbol of the perfected and regenerated man whose divine nature shines forth. After years of research, Buff Perry now believes the stone was brought to America by secret societies from Scotland in the years preceding the American Revolution. For them, the stone was to empower the foundation of a new republic. Why is it called the foundation stone for America? The foundation stone for America because it was brought here by the Jacobites who had been arrested at Preston in 1715 in their attempt to overthrow uh, the kings. The kings in question are the line of English kings who succeeded King James II, who was deposed from his throne in 1688 and succeeded by William of Orange. But the supporters of James rebelled against the deposing of their favorite monarch. They were called Jacobites, a name derived from Jacobus, the Latin version of James. In short, the Jacobites were mostly Scottish Highlanders who were determined to restore James and the House of Stuart to the English throne. But the reason King James II was deposed presents a powerful clue as to why America has been steadily transformed into a cornucopia of pagan and occult philosophies. King James had proclaimed that Jews and Presbyterians and Quakers and Catholics and even Ottomans should be embraced by the Church of England. That's why he was deposed. So the the subsequent formation of this Jacobite revolutionary uh, social order was in, in, in re reaction to his deposition and in support of his embrace of Jews, Presbyterians, Quakers, Catholics, and Ottoman Muslims. Since the Protestant English rejected James' ecumenical ideas, and also feared that the hand of Rome was somehow involved. The Scottish Jacobites engaged in a series of rebellions against the new line of English kings. But their rebellions were ultimately crushed. And as a result, many of the Jacobite fugitives fled across the waters of the Atlantic to America. Uh, in 1715, uh, there was a, a rebellion in a place called Preston, northern England. Many uh, of the Jacobites uh, were arrested and deported or exiled to America. Standish family, Anson family, notable families in American history, pre-revolutionary history. Families that then uh, went on to become part of the, the, the War of Independence, the American Revolution notable uh, Masons and Freemasons. These notable Freemasons were the survivors of the Jacobite resistance in Scotland, a land with a long history of secret societies whose influence is both mysterious and extensive. Consider that centuries earlier, the Knights Templar fled persecution and are said to have hidden themselves within the Masonic lodges of Scotland. In the 19th century, Albert Pike would develop the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, which would become the most powerful arm of Masonry in America. Meanwhile, President Woodrow Wilson once said that every line of strength in American history is a line colored with Scottish blood. Perhaps the best example of the Jacobite influence in early America is found in Hugh Mercer, often called an unsung hero of the American Revolution. Mercer was a Jacobite doctor who supported the cause against England until their final defeat at the Battle of Culloden in 1746. 
he was then forced to flee to America, leaving his homeland behind. He served as Brigadier General in the Continental Army and was a close personal advisor to George Washington. It's even believed that it was Hugh Mercer who suggested that General Washington make his famous crossing of the Delaware River on Christmas of 1776. Incredibly, one of Hugh Mercer's children would marry into the Patton family and ultimately produce World War II hero General George S. Patton, whose blood and guts reputation was certainly in keeping with the Jacobite tradition. But in the years prior to the American Revolution, Hugh Mercer became a member of the Masonic Lodge in Fredericksburg, Virginia the early members of which are said to be a who's who of revolutionary war heroes. Mercer's fellow members included George Washington and James Monroe. At least eight Masons from this lodge served as generals during the American Revolution, while two of them would go on to become American presidents. The Fredericksburg Lodge still exists today, and on its website, states that it was chartered by the Grand Lodge of Scotland, July 21st, 1758. A history of the Lodge says the following. The Lodge was formed by men who had been made Masons earlier and elsewhere, Scotland most likely. There was in Fredericksburg in the 1750s a notable Scottish mercantile presence. Many of those early Lodge members bore Scottish surnames and it was to Scotland, not England, that the Lodge later turned for a proper charter. Is it possible that the influence of the Scottish Jacobite rebels worked as an undercurrent that helped to inspire the American Revolution? These families, they, they come under the, the general umbrella term Jacobite, uh, were the real uh, core population that that led to the ultimately to the War of Independence. Consider that the three Jacobite uprisings are referred to as rebellions. During the revolutionary era, the motto rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God was adopted, a motto that Benjamin Franklin wanted to include on the design of the Great Seal. But rebellion against authority was not exactly the tradition of the Puritan pilgrims who began the country. Their focus was on the biblical teaching of Jesus and the apostles. When Harvard University was founded in 1636, its motto was truth for Christ and the church. Harvard's statement of purpose went on to say that the main end of life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life. But by the revolutionary era, references to God were more ambiguous, often referring to the guidance of divine providence. It has been noted that the revolutionary founders were not known for quoting the sayings of Jesus Christ. They certainly mentioned his name or made reference to Christianity. They said things like, no king but King Jesus. But his teachings were absent from their writings. Sayings like, turn the other cheek, love your enemies, and bless them that curse you, had no place in a movement that was founded on rebellion. As a result, it becomes little surprise that once the New Republic was founded, biblical imagery of Christ and the Gospels would be missing from the capital city. Instead, a celebration of pagan gods and goddesses would prevail, which seems to represent the ecumenical views of King James II and his Masonic Jacobite rebels. The chief Jacobite symbol was the white rose, traditionally worn on their Scottish bonnets. This dagger features a Jacobite rose with a pentagram in the center. Notice that the pentagram has a dot in the middle, which usually signifies the sun. The five points of the star symbolize the rotation of Venus around the sun, 
forming a pentagram over an eight-year cycle. This symbol was well known to the secret societies of Europe and is found carved throughout Washington, D.C. In light of these things, the question Americans today should ask is, if the idea of rebellion was in obedience to God, what God did they mean? Which brings us back to the Stone of Destiny, a mysterious artifact whose original owner has for centuries been acknowledged as the greatest rebel of all time. The belief is that the real stone was not captured by the English in 1296, but was somehow hidden away by the Scots. Buff Perry believes that centuries later, the Jacobites brought the stone with them to America. To bring it over here was to, first of all, find refuge or sanctuary for it, but also to indicate this is where the Jacobite revolution might really be successful. 1715, the first rebellion, 1745, the second, and then we have the 1770s with the, with the Declaration of Independence. Uh, you know, we have the Boston Tea Party, then we have the, the, the sort of prolonged war of, of independence, all brought about by these same people. So foundation stone, meaning this stone now is going to be placed here where the order will have its ultimate, its ultimate political uh, fruition and success. Well, this is Helen Aurorik, a, a, a painting of her, uh, I believe by Nicholas, and she's bearing the white rose, which came to mean what you swear an oath of secrecy in relation to. And the Jacobites would swear sub rosa with a single white rose. Her left hand yeah, hand and elbow are right alongside of, of the casket. The symbology is extremely interesting. You know, j just the, the, the bearing of the white rose alone is, to me, highly suggestive of what she felt to be a secret mission that was associated with this stone that, that they received. It seems clear that their secret mission had to do with creating a one world order through the League of Nations and by supporting the New Deal, which both FDR and Henry Wallace believed was the new order of the ages. It was during FDR's administration that the National Archives building was completed, with the figure of what appears to be a perfected man carved upon it. The figure is called Destiny. With the word destiny used repeatedly by the key figures who influenced the dollar bill, FDR, Wallace, and Manley Hall, is it possible that they all believed the stone of destiny had come to America through Nicholas Rorick? But exactly what destiny they had in mind for America and the world must give us pause when we consider the full history of the stone. According to an ancient legend, the stone that fell from heaven is a jewel that was cut from the crown of Lucifer himself. Commenting on this, Manley P. Hall writes that the Lapis Exilis, crown jewel of the Archangel Lucifer, fell from heaven. Michael, Archangel of the Sun, at the head of the angelic hosts, swooped down upon Lucifer. During the conflict, Michael with his sword struck the flashing Lapis Exilis from the coronet of his adversary. 
and the green stone fell into the dark and immeasurable abyss. Paul goes on to say that out of Lucifer's radiant gem was fashioned the Sangreal, or Holy Grail, from which Christ is said to have drunk at the Last Supper. This idea seems to be captured in this depiction of the Grail by Dante Gabriel Rossetti. Rossetti was a 19th century esoteric painter who is said to have influenced modern Rosicrucianism. He may well have been familiar with the ancient legend since his grail cup appears to be a dark emerald green mounted in a golden frame. But according to the various legends that are told, the stone of Lucifer was divided into different parts. One part became the grail chalice, while King Solomon is said to have fashioned another part into a ring. Yet another part became the stone of the Kaaba, while this stone is black, Manley Hall suggests that Islam venerates the color green because of its association with the Grail Stone. Others believe the Grail Stone is the same as the Emerald Tablet. A depiction of this tablet can be found in the floor mosaic of the Cathedral of Siena, next to an image of Hermes Trismegistus or Hermes Thrice Great. As such, it is known as the Emerald Tablet of Hermes. Written upon it is the Hermetic Maxim, that which is below is like that which is above. The tablet is also called the Philosopher's Stone and is well known in the ancient world. Sir Isaac Newton even did his own transcription of the Emerald Tablet. In the modern world, Carl Jung is said to have had dreams of the Emerald Tablet. Manley Hall obviously knew about it and even published his own illustration. Hall writes that the oldest and most revered of all the alchemical formulae is the sacred Emerald Tablet of Hermes. In her book on the Merovingian mythos, occult author Tracy Twyman writes that the story of the Emerald Tablet of Hermes appears to be yet another incarnation of the Grail as stone. She goes on to say, the legend connected to these items and the stone they came from relate that the stone bounced off Cain's head as it fell to earth, leaving a scar on his forehead in the shape of a red serpent, the mark of Cain. This is what the Grail as stone represents. Meanwhile, Nicholas Rorick called his stone a Chintamani, an example of which is shown in this image of a Buddhist figure who holds a greenish Chintamani stone in his hand. While the legends of these stones vary and researchers often disagree, it is curious that both Rorick and Manley Hall use the same variant spelling of Eschenbach's term for the Grail Stone. Deschenbach uh, uh, wrote Lapsit Exilis rather than Lapis Exilis. In each of their writings, both Rorick and Hall used the term Lapis Exilis. This might be written off as mere coincidence, if not for the fact that Hall was meeting with Rorick in the upper penthouse of the master building. This suggests that they had the same understanding of the stone. Furthermore, both men were involved, along with Henry Wallace, in the theosophical teachings of Madame H.P. Blavatsky, who openly asserted the ancient Gnostic belief that the true God is Lucifer. As such, for Rorick to have a piece of Lucifer's gemstone would have had great significance. Dr. Obadiah Harris explained to us the importance of Madame Blavatsky to Manley Hall and to his writings about the founding and destiny of America. There's another important lady over here that um, Mr. Hall wanted to honor and that is Helen Blavatsky, a Russian woman 
by the way, her little house in Russia, and I understand now, is the National Museum. But in the early days, uh, he wanted to pay tribute to her contribution, and she was the co-founder of the Theosophical Society, whose headquarters now is in is in India. Um, she she wrote Isis Unveiled, um, the Secret Doctrine, and it is said I don't know if this is true, but it, you know, she she died in 1891. Manny Hall was born in 1901. But it is said that he had read the secret doctrine by the time he was 12 years old and understood it. So there's a, a, a feeling that Manly Hall had a, had a bond with this woman, a kind of spiritual bond. And that when he wrote Secret Teachings of America, he was really writing the next book for her secret teaching, secret doctrine. That he was taking it farther, and he did. So he, he felt that in her was a kind of something of the isthmus of the spirit that, that gave birth to the Philosophical Research Society. If what Dr. Harris says is true, then Hall founded his entire society on the Luciferian doctrines of Madame H.P. Blavatsky. Well, Bandy Hall, of course, really was one of the leaders of this whole world esoteric movement for, you know, for probably 70 years or more. And he wrote extensively about the, the ancient mysteries, and he eventually joined the Masons, and of course moved up very rapidly to the 33rd degree Mason, and then to the upper levels of Masonry, which are truly into the Luciferian, which most Masons have no idea even exists. In his writings, Hall said that when the Mason learns the mystery of his craft, the seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands. This quote comes from the book, The Lost Keys of Freemasonry, that was first published in 1923, the same year the casket had been delivered to the Roricks in Paris. The Luciferian Freemasonry described by Hall could very well have been known by such Masons as Henry Wallace and FDR especially if FDR was so familiar with Hall that he sent emissaries to Hall's library. Also consider that FDR's successor, Harry Truman, a fellow Mason, had Hall's books on his shelves. And certainly, Manly Hall's view of Lapis Exilis as the gemstone of Lucifer would not likely have escaped the attention of Nicholas Rorick. Despite Rorick's international mystique and influence in the Oval Office, he eventually suffered a sudden and sharp decline. While searching for seeds and grasses for the Department of Agriculture, he was also heavily involved with the politics of Central Asia. Buff Perry believes that prior to his fall, Rorick was working to amalgamate the countries of Asia into a united Buddhist theocracy that would ultimately be joined to a one-world government. In Nicholas Rorick's efforts to bring about an amalgamated, if you will, theocratic Buddhist nation that would have consisted of Manchuria, Mongolia, Tibet, part of China, perhaps part of India, perhaps some of Siberia, uh, he, he was working with the Tashi Lama, who was uh, suspected by China, particularly, and to this day very much suspected by China, um, you know, as being uh, subversive to the stability of the region. And as a result of this, uh, Rorick became associated with, with accusations of, uh, of uh, espionage. Perry's further suspicion is that, at least for a time, Rorick's political efforts were on behalf of FDR's New Deal administration. We recorded the following conversation with Perry in December of 2008. So we've got the, the uh, 
uh, what nobody's talking about right now in American media, the North American Union, right, through the free right. agreement. The European Union, which is known about, but we never hear about it on the news. Right. And now there's an, uh, this Asian Union. It seems like Rorik was being used by the American government to lay the foundation for or to bring about an Asian Union. You've got it. That I, I accept wholeheartedly. And I, and I think it's it, it, when you read it, the details, factual details, it, it, it's inescapable. That America saw in Rorik the, the 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 capability of creating this great Asian Union, and he was supported by American intelligence. Rorik was supported when he was trying to bring together that great new nation. He, who was he reporting to? He was reporting to the the American consulates in China. The official story seems to be that once Rorik was accused of being a spy. He fell out of favor with his two greatest supporters, Henry Wallace and Louis Horch. But what about Rorick's so-called Stone of Destiny, this holy grail that he claimed was in his possession, supposedly buried inside the cornerstone of the master building? Whether the stone or some part of it is there or not, Buff Perry has come to the conclusion that Rorick's artifact was a cunningly devised fable just for our audience just you don't buy into the idea of the mystical magical nature of this stone absolutely not and and you think it was a, a showpiece uh, fabricated by the Rorick's really to beguile guys like Henry Wallace it seems like yes I do I, d I do when we first interviewed Buff several years ago, he seemed to have the impression that the Stone of Destiny was the same stone that Rorik had in his possession. Today, he believes they are not at all the same thing, and that perhaps this is what caused Wallace to become disillusioned with his guru. I think Wallace uh, felt perhaps deceived when He's anticipating the arrival of what he called the Stone of Destiny in correspondence uh, and then ends up with, you know, nothing in effect. Nevertheless, Perry still believes that Jacob's Pillow Stone, which is said to be the real Stone of Destiny, was brought to America by the Jacobites and may have been recovered by the French-Canadian explorer La Verandry in the 1700s. The, the La Verandry Stone is, a, you know, clearly has some association with the Stone of Destiny. But the whereabouts of the stone today are still unknown. As a Jewish researcher, the real stone holds special significance for Buff Perry. According to the Jewish belief, the Pillow Stone of Jacob is one of the original artifacts that was kept in King Solomon's Temple in Jerusalem. The stone, variously called the Stone of Destiny, Foundation Stone, Pillow Stone of Jacob, and other titles, is expected and is necessary uh, to be in Jerusalem for the final construction of the final temple. The Jews believe that that temple, and not all Jews, but most of the Jews today, active in rabbinical orders that are preparing to, you know, conduct all the rituals in the final temple as we speak, um, believe that all articles that were in Solomon's temple have to be returned if they're known to exist. If they're not known to exist, then it's a different matter. But all those that are known to exist must be returned and would then go into use again in the final temple. Buff believes that Nicholas and Helen O'Rourke aligned their Chintamani stone with the Stone of Destiny in order to sensationalize their own cause. But others continue to believe that Rorick's stone was from the stars and had real power. The Rorick's themselves were known for tapping into the supernatural realm. Uh, the Rorick's were particularly eccentric. Helen O'Rourke spent much of her lifetime channeling a spirit that called itself Master Mariah, the same spirit that inspired Madame Blavatsky 
to declare that Lucifer was God. We told you earlier about the letter from Zena Fosdick that describes the contents of the Rajput casket placed inside the cornerstone of the master building. But we neglected to mention a few of the items that Buff Perry talked about. But there are all kinds of other ingredients. There are different fabrics and coins. And, and what's, the, what's the thing? Talk about the coins again. Well, these are, uh, in some cases, coins that materialized out of what would be considered occultation out of, out of the other world in, in different meetings and sessions that were held uh, by the Rorix. And I'm not saying this uh, off the cuff or because I heard it from someone else. These are recorded memoirs of Helena and Nicholas Rorick. And of course, many of the people who are into the New Age are into astral projection and in contact with these spirit beings. And there really are spirit beings out there. They refer to them as the masters of wisdom or the great white brotherhood or the enlightened ones. And they believe that they are guiding society. These are actually demonic forces uh, and demonic beings. And of course, they can materialize and disappear. The average individual says, oh, that can't be true. And yet it is true. And when you talk to the people who are dealing with this, they come in contact with this many times. They have accessed this other dimension, which is truly a demonic dimension. And of course, tragically, it's becoming increasingly apparent here in America as we turn our back on God and we're not really a secular society. We've gone from being a Christian society to a secular society and now a society dominated by the occult forces of which are intent upon ruling the world. If it's true that the Rorix were in contact with the spirit realm, is it then possible that these same powers could have somehow influenced the design of the dollar bill? While the history surrounding FDR's administration is disturbing, there is said to be a darker level and one that is openly satanic in the design of the dollar bill. These allegations begin with a group founded in Bavaria in 1776 known as the Illuminati. The order was founded by a man named Adam Weishaupt with the alleged purpose of perfecting society. The symbolism of the dollar bill, Adam Weissach, do you really think it has anything to do with the Illuminati, in your opinion? Is the Illuminati to be defined as Freemasons and Rosicrucians and other uh, secret society members? If that's the case, then yes, I believe the, the symbol on the dollar bill, the truncated pyramid, is directly related to the Illuminati, because Rorick was the Illuminati. In the 18th century, the original order was thought to have a bloodthirsty agenda, and it was believed that they secretly worshipped Lucifer. George Washington warned about the Illuminati in his letters, while Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin were thought to be members of its inner circle. Which brings us to our next speaker. He claims to have been raised in a modern Illuminati family that dates back to the 1700s. He says that, as a child, he was made to practice black magic and witchcraft. His name is Doc Marquis. My family goes back into the Illuminati all the way back to 1789. Of course, we have no way of either confirming or denying Doc's claims, but it is worth noting that he has acted as an expert on the occult for law enforcement and the FBI. According to his publisher, in the past he has appeared on and consulted for Geraldo Rivera and Oprah Winfrey, and for shows like Hard Copy, Inside Edition, and Unsolved Mysteries. Doc has been a Christian since 1979, but he says that part of his upbringing in a family that worshiped Lucifer was to be taught about the secret Illuminati symbols of the dollar bill. 
and that understanding them begins with the Rothschild dynasty. Maya Amschel Rothschild had made a very interesting and profound statement. He said, allow me to control and issue the money of a nation and I care not who writes its laws. And he was right. Meyer Amschel Rothschild is called the founding father of international finance. In 2005, Forbes magazine ranked him seventh on their list of the 20 most influential businessmen of all time. All this happened um, back in 1776. And this was doing May 1st and shortly thereafter. The significance behind that is that on May 1st, 1776, Dr. Adam Weishaupt, who was a defrocked Jesuit um, priest, who was given the chair of the professorship of religious um, studies at Ingolstadt University, was approached by Maya Amschel Bauer, who would later change his last name to Rothschild, along with 12 of his most financially influential friends. They knew Weishaupt at that particular time was not only a genius when it came to the occult world, but Weishaupt also had an axe to grind because it was the Catholic Church that just recently defrocked him. He was no longer a Jesuit priest, and he was going to send a message to them, to the monarchies of Europe, and to all other people who would try to have their will over his. What Rothschild and Weisopt came up with was a plan to destroy the old world system of government through monarchies and the church and to set up a new world order in its place. This is said to be the great plan of all the secret societies. So what happened? My Angel Bauer approached Weisopt and basically told him, we know you've got the occult knowledge and genius to put it all together. We've got the money. You do it, we'll back it. Just to paraphrase what really happened. So in 1773, Weishaupt started creating what had never been created before. The idea of Illuminism had always been around, ever since the days of Babylon, with the co-founders of being that Nimrod and Semiramis but no one had ever been able to actualize it. However, May 1st, 1776, the order of the Illuminati had become a reality under the auspices of Dr. Adam Weishaupt. Now, like other nations, orders, countries and such, they have their two great seals. The order of the Illuminati does. Those two seals can be found on the back of a one dollar bill. People mistake those to be the two great seals of the United States of America. They are not. Those are the two seals of the order, order of the Illuminati. And I'm going to explain it to you. In order to understand the seal itself, we have to first take a look at every single thing that composites it. We look at the first part of it on, on our left, which would be the truncated pyramid one. Above it, is a 13-letter Latin expression that says annuit corruptus and directly underneath the base of the pyramid is a three-word Latin expression which is novus or disaclone. If you were to look up the word, let's say work, in the English um, um, dictionary, you're going to find at least 50 different meanings for it. It is the same thing in Latin. Different words have different meanings. They have more than one meaning. Um, the word seclorum, one of the definitive meanings is it is um, secular. Something that is secular is of the world. So it is proper, very proper, to translate the bottom as new world order, the novice order seclorum. The whole of it is saying, announcing the birth of a new world order. This would be Dr. Adam Weishaupt himself, the very first head of the order of the Illuminati. It was Weishaupt who had himself come up with a seven-part plan to create what he called the Novus Ordo Seclorum, or the New World Order. This is the person responsible for it. 
The interesting thing about the front of the dollar bill is that there are four huge ones. There is one in every single corner. Now, if we look at each of every single one of them, they each have an oval around it, except for the top right hand one. Now, if we look at this blow up version of it, you will find there is no oval. This is a shield that is surrounding the one. Now, the reason there was a shield here is because this is very similar to the original shield that was given to the Rothschild family when Baron Meyer Amschel Rothschild had become um, knighted in England and received the lordship. If we look across the top of this shield, all the way to the left-hand side, it drops down and forms a crescent moon. It's a crescent moon because it represents the female goddess in the occult world. At the bottom of that shield, of the, excuse me, of that lunar moon, you will see the owl. And it's very obvious, once you take a good look at that part of the crescent moon, and it is the same Illuminati owl that is being worshipped at the Bohemian Grove in California by those members of the Bohemian Grove, where presidents, premiers, kings and queens and heads of nations throughout this world have met. You can tell just by looking at this photo, that is a 40-foot owl, it is made out of oak, and that the worshippers are surrounding that fire pit around that altar, which is easily reflected in the lake around them. This is definitely the owl of the Illuminati. The rituals performed at the Bohemian Grove are occult and idolatrous. One of them, called the cremation of care, is supposed to be a mock human sacrifice, though some suggest that real killings take place. When President Nixon was there, he commented about the extreme homosexual environment at this all-male boys club. Among other powerful American leaders who have been spotted at the Grove are Ronald Reagan, Dwight Eisenhower, Jimmy Carter, Newt Gingrich, and George Bush, Jr. and Sr. Now, when we take a look at the O, it is actually, occultically speaking, the shape of the Olibars, the snake that's going around in a circle, devouring itself. This O is actually the eye in this lady's face that they want to look at. This is the O. Now, what's in the center of this O? You take a good look. It is the exact same owl of the Illuminati that we saw on the back of the one dollar bill. So the question then becomes, who owns L'Oreal? But the owl seems to be a major symbol for the secret societies, as they are found repeatedly inside government buildings in Washington, D.C. And a giant owl figure is even seen in the street design, with the United States Capitol in the midst of it. Now the Druids um, from um, the Gaelic means, Druid means men of oak. These people worshipped creation among other things, but um, their sacred symbol was the owl because the ancient god of magic and of the hunt was Pallas Athena. Her bird was the owl and that owl represented wisdom that always has. Pallas Athena was also the goddess figure who was said to inspire Sir Francis Bacon. But now look at this owl seal at the Bohemian Grove, where it says, Weaving spiders come not here. While the line is taken from Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream, could this also be a veiled reference to what seems like a spider web design that forms the background of the dollar bill? Are there additional secrets hidden there? Now, I'm sure you've heard of um, a Rorschach smear or the Rorschach inkblot test as created by Dr. Rorschach himself. 
um, you see the ink in the forefront and everything else is in the background. This way your subconscious mind is supposed to pick up on what's on the foreground and you're supposed to be able to tell what you are subconsciously seeing. Notice how it's very busy. Lot of intersection diagonally lines, you can't make out what's there. But let's get rid of the background noise, get rid of all the diagonal lines that doesn't belong there, and let's reverse the principle of Roshan and take what's in the background and bring it to the forefront and see what's there. Because once we do that, we find out it's quite obvious that there is another Illuminati owl and that it is perched on something that looks like an arrow. That is what they don't want you to see. Once you see this owl here and compare it to the other one on the left hand side of it, it becomes very obvious that this is an owl. You can now begin to, to distinguish beyond all that busy signals and such that they don't want you to look through, yet they place there in honor of the totem bird, the Owl of Wisdom, which is um, the totem bird because their god, Lucifer, was supposed to have been the wisest of all of God's creation. Wisdom of Lucifer, wisdom into the bird, wisdom into the word Illuminati. Therefore, you know, the chain of wisdom is followed all the way through. All right, now, did they teach you this in the Illuminati? Yes. Well, I want you to understand that the first symbol is known as a pentalpha, from the Greek word for five, pente. Um, it is a five-pointed star. Now, this next one is a pentacle. Now, it looks similar, but I want you to notice how it is interwoven. It runs through and in between itself. Now this next symbol is what's known as the Star of David, the Morgan David, the Jewish Star, the Seal of Solomon. There's numbers for it. This is the symbol for the nation of Israel. Now when you take a look at it very carefully, you will notice that it is two equilateral triangles that are interwoven. This shows the union of God with man. However, when you look at the next one, it's similar to it. It's known as a hexagon. This is when you take two equilateral triangles, place one on top of another. Symbolically speaking, you're placing man above God. Now, this next symbol is the foulest, the most evil of all symbols in the occult world. There is nothing that can even come close. It is known as the hexagram. It is the six-pointed star with a circle surrounding it. It is this symbol that must be used during high ceremonial magic or high ceremonial witchcraft when you are summoning up demons to this plane of existence. The use of the hexagram is said by Doc to be very symbolic and seems to represent the occult concept of a Christ figure just as the Maitreya was for Nicholas Rorick and Henry Wallace. But what Christ do they mean? Doc believes the pattern of hexagrams in the design of the dollar bill provides the clue. If we take a look at the 13 stars directly above the head of the eagle and connect the dots, you will see where the very first hexagram is located. And if you notice that surrounding the hexagram is the 28 guidelines that make a circle. Now, inside every single point, the six points, is a star. There are six of them. They surround now the seven stars. Remember, six is the number of man, seven is the number of God. Now, it is man that is surrounding God or is placed above God. If what Doc is saying is true, this could represent the person the Bible calls the man of sin, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped.
Doc's interpretation seems to also fit the worship of Lucifer. For in the Bible, Lucifer declares that he will exalt his throne above the stars of God. Next, Doc claims a second hexagram can be found by connecting the various points where the much talked about number 13 is represented. And don't try to tell me it's the 13 colonies. There are 13 stars above the eagle's head, 13 stripes in the shield, 13 leaves on the olive branch, 13 arrows in the eagle's talon, and then 13 letters in the phrase E Pluribus Unum, which makes for two points on either side of the eagle's head, for the six points total of the hexagram. If we take a close look at the same seal and connect all the 13 together, just like we did when we were kids, when we were playing that game, connect the dots. Once we connect all the 13s, it becomes very apparent where the second hexagram can be found. In this one, which is very obvious, already comes with a circle around it. So this is the second hexagram here in figure two? Yes. And then where's the third hexagram? The third hexagram can be found on the other part of the great seal. Again, connect all the 13 together, the 13 um, letters, the 13 um, steps in the pyramid, connect all this together. And you'll note, with the circle that's already there, it forms the third hexagram. In other words, a six, a six, and a six. A six, six, six. Doc has deciphered a code that, if there, would glorify Lucifer's Messiah, whom the Bible calls the Beast or Antichrist. In the book of Revelation, it reads, Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score, and six. Could there really be three six-pointed hexagrams on the dollar bill? Once we start at the base of the pyramid, which is the foundation of all things, and follow the design of the hexagram itself, you're going to find out something very startling. We go from the M and follow the symbol all the way up to the A. The A cuts directly underneath the eye of Lucifer all the way to the S. The S connects all the way down. It goes in between the V and the I and connects all the way to the O. And following the symbol, the O connects up and over along the symbol of the hexagram to the word N. In perfect sequence, it's M-A-S-O-N, Mason. It's not what a lot of other people have espoused that the symbol connects down to the M in Seclorum and that the word is an anagram or something like that. Those people who are doing that obviously don't know what they're talking about or they don't know how to plagiarize me correctly because the order of the Illuminati have stated and always will state this is perfectly spelled out to be M-A-S-O-N Mason. This points conclusively that the Masons have been involved in the order of the Illuminati. This was back during the Council of Willemsbad which would have been July 16, 1782. All right, so what are we seeing? Now, if we look at the bottom one of the reverse side of the dollar bill, you'll see on the right-hand side that, again, there's a lot of busy intersecting diagonal lines. Yet, if we apply the same principle we just used to reveal the, the hidden owls of the Illuminati and apply it, you will find that there is now a skulled 
faced winged demon. And it is very obvious, once you take away the background, the busy noise, it becomes very apparent what it is and that it's been there all along. And if we just simply go and enlarge the, that section, just start with a small one, and just keep enlarging it, and enlarge it even more, even with the background noise there, as I call it, I think it becomes very apparent what we are now looking at. That it is still a skull-faced winged demon. And it is these demons that are protecting and blessing the two great seals of the Order of the Illuminati. And it would make perfect sense that it had to be demons used to protect these seals since I am convinced it was those same demons that handed them over to Thomas Jefferson when they first created them. I am convinced beyond all doubt that that indeed was a demon sent up from the bowels of hell probably under the direct orders of Lucifer himself. Doc Marquis makes it clear that he is no longer involved in the occult and that since becoming a Christian, he has dedicated himself to warning others about the activities of the secret societies that worship Lucifer. I've been doing this now since the late 70s when I first left the Order of the Illuminati and that's when I'm, um, at that point I had become a born-again Christian. At that time, I realized what I had um, been doing all along. Maybe in my own way of trying to make up for what I had done, and I've done a lot of heinous things in this life, I begin to wonder if I'm not trying to make up or atone for some of those things I had done. And I know in my heart of hearts that as a born again child of the King, my sins have already been bought and paid for. But still, there's just that part of me that still feels so guilty about everything I've done. So it could be in my own way, and I'm, I'm somewhat convinced that in my own way, I'm still trying to make up for all those crimes I was guilty of when I was in the Illuminati. Doc makes it clear that he believes demonic forces were behind the design of the dollar bill and are working through secret societies. One of them is the Order of the Eastern Star, the female chapter of Freemasonry, whose icon is an inverted pentagram, a symbol associated with the satanic goat of Mendes. Ed Decker told us a story about a woman he once counseled who was involved in this society. I got a call one day after I had published a book on it and uh, a little book called The Question of Freemasonry. And in that book, I had, on one page, is the actual Goat of Mendes. The Goat of Mendes is a very significant symbol since it was designed by 19th century French magician, Eliphas Levi, without question, the most influential occultist of the last 200 years. In his books, Levi glorified Lucifer and Satan, and his writings were quoted extensively by every major occult leader, including Albert Pike, Madame H.P. Blavatsky, and Manly P. Hall. Now listen carefully to Ed Decker's story. I got a call from some place back in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and this was years ago, and a lady called me up and she said, I want to talk to you. She said, I received a copy of your book. I, I am a, uh, the, the head of the Eastern Star for my state. And she said, every time I go to uh, another area of the state to, to uh, do the induction of the leadership of the local chapters of the Eastern Star, I have these bad dreams. And it's like this demon comes in and attacks me in my bedroom. And it's this evil, evil thing. And it was beginning to bother me. And someone mentioned to me that, you know, 
the Masons and the, and the stuff that they do isn't really godly. You might want to study it a little bit. She said, so she told me that she went to a Christian bookstore and asked them if they had anything on the Eastern Star or Freemasonry. And the lady said, you know, I, in the mail, I had just gotten this booklet. It's called The Question of Freemasonry by this guy, Ed Decker. And she said, I opened the book. I opened it up to the page. It just opened to the page that you have the Goat of Mindy's on there. And I looked at that, and that's the demon that's been coming into my room and attacking me when I'm around, going around the state and doing the, the inductions of the Ladies of the Eastern Star. She said, I ran down three blocks to my husband's office, left my car right in the parking lot of the Christian bookstore, ran down there, got my husband out of his, I think he was an insurance agent or something, and said, look at this. They left there, went home, read the book, got on their knees, confessed it as sin, renounced it, and had that thing taken off their back. And from that time on, all that heaviness left her. When it went away, it just moved off her entire spirit. It was a spirit of darkness and evil. And it was the goat of Mindy's, the same thing that's on the Medal of Honor, the same thing that's built into the Capitol and the Mall and the White House, built in there. It's the same evil spirit. This whole idea of the Messiah... And its relation, and the Messiah's relationship to the stone, and who that Messiah would be, and you know what would happen when the stone is returned to Jerusalem, and when the temple is built, it would be a a, a, a replica of the original Solomon Temple, not the Ezekiel, you know, account, so, which is so, what most Jews believe. The Ezekiel account, no Jews believe that the Solomon's Temple is going to be rebuilt in that architectural style. But the Masons believe, if I, under, if I understand them right, that when that stone uh, finds its way to Jerusalem, it's one of the last items necessary, uh, and that, that there are certain rabbinical orders, to the, actually, that I've met today that are anticipating its return. They, you know, once it returns, then they proceed with a, with a, a blueprint to, uh, to uh, you know, take the Temple Mount and, and put up the what they consider to be the final temple that Ezekiel described. But the stone, is, it's all pivotal upon the return of this stone because Solomon brought that stone in in the, le in the traditions and legends in Judaism um, into the, in the, his original temple, and, and upon it the, the incense was burned in the fire uh, pan. According to Masonic author David Ovison, the word dollar comes from the German word taller. While there are many taller designs, one in particular is mentioned, with the image of Jesus Christ crucified on one side, while the reverse bears the image of a serpent on a cross and a reference to the book of Numbers from the Old Testament. In this account, the children of Israel had complained against God. The scripture says, And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much of the people of Israel died. When they repented, God commanded Moses to erect a bronze serpent upon a pole, saying that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. In the New Testament, Jesus made reference to the bronze serpent as a picture of his crucifixion. He said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Some believe that the serpent cross is the original inspiration for the American dollar sign today. While the image of the bronze serpent holds a very particular meaning for Christianity. David Ovison explains that Kabbalists and alchemists find an interesting parallel in the Hebrew gematria. The Hebrew word for the serpent of Moses is nakash, which means the shining one. The numerical gematria for nakash is 358. This is also the numerical equivalent for the Hebrew word Mashiach or Messiah. 
Ovison claims that these numerical equivalents allowed magicians to draw a connection between the brazen or bronze serpent and the Messiah. But exactly what Messiah do they mean? The phrase e pluribus unum, or out of many, one, appears in the banner held in the mouth of the American eagle. The word one appears a total of seven times on the dollar bill. Ovison writes, In magical numerology, the number seven is regarded with a special veneration. Certain texts that deal with the meanings of numbers insist that seven stands for the complete temple. The temple he refers to is the ancient temple of God, built by King Solomon in the city of Jerusalem. Ovison goes on to say that the concept of a complete temple is symbolized by the unfinished pyramid of the Great Seal, where the symbol of a Messiah figure is also shown with the all-seeing eye, representing the capstone that will one day complete the pyramid. In other words, when the Messiah emerges, then will the temple be complete. But just who this Messiah will be is the subject of intense debate, and the clues to his identity are said to be related to the temple itself. The site of Solomon's original temple at the Temple Mount in Jerusalem is still considered a sacred and holy place. Buildings are sacred in religions. Religious buildings are sacred. So Solomon's temple is sacred. The Knights Templar were specifically named in reference to this ancient site. They were known as the Poor Knights of Christ and of the Temple of Solomon. The Knights Templar lived on the Temple Mount. Today, the Temple Mount has on it the Dome of the Rock and Al-Aqsa Mosque. The Knights Templar had their headquarters in Al-Aqsa Mosque when they were there. So the association between this arcane direction and tradition in Europe with the Knights Templar and the temple of the Temple Mount is direct. The sacred nature of the temple was handed down from the Templars to the Freemasons, who are said to have originated from the ancient Knights. Masonic philosopher Albert Pike wrote that every Masonic lodge is a temple of religion. Another Masonic philosopher, Albert Mackey, wrote that of all the objects which constitute the Masonic science of symbolism, the most important, the most cherished by the Mason, and by far the most significant, is the Temple of Jerusalem. The spiritualizing of the Temple is the first, the most prominent, and the most pervading of all the symbols of Freemasonry. Take from Freemasonry its dependence on the Temple, and the system itself would at once decay and die. According to David Ovison, who is himself a Freemason, the dream of a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem is the true symbolism of the unfinished pyramid on the back of the dollar bill. But is it merely a coincidence that these symbols would end up on the foundation of America's currency? Is there a further connection with Solomon's temple? and the mysterious Knights Templar. The Templars were there on the mount. They lived on the mount. So they were living a dream. And the dream is the same dream Christopher Columbus had and wrote about extensively in returning to Jerusalem with the gold from the Americas to build the temple. Was this the true purpose of Columbus's voyage? to finance the rebuilding of Solomon's temple? And was this desire handed down from the Templars to Columbus to modern masonry? As we have shown before, the ships of Columbus sailed with a red cross on a white background, the symbol of the Knights Templar. But despite the interest of Templars and Freemasons, the original temple begins with the Jewish people. The temple was critical to Judaism. It was the heart of Judaism. The first Jewish temple, built by King Solomon, 
was destroyed by the Babylonians in 587 BC. The temple became a necessity for the existence of Judaism. So when it was destroyed, the longing for another temple in, in the Babylonian exile was, you know, primary. The foundation for a second temple was laid by Zerubbabel when the first Jews returned from their captivity in ancient Babylon. First thing, when, when Jews are able to return, they build a temple. There's Zerubbabel and Ezra and Nehemiah come together. There's a, a temple built. It's added on to over the centuries until you end up with Herod's temple. The second temple was in existence during the time of Christ and the apostles. But it would also be destroyed, a terrible event that Jesus himself had prophesied. The scripture says that the disciples came to show Jesus the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all of these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that its desolation is nigh. And so it came to pass that the second temple was destroyed with the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Yet in the aftermath of its terrible destruction would emerge the dream for a third temple and what some believe will be the final temple of all time. This arcane connection to Freemasonry has its roots in the longing for the temple, the longing for the final temple, for the ultimate temple where Haggayim, where non-Jews pray with Jews, as the old books, you know, the last old books of the Old Testament predict will happen. When does that temple get built. The idea of a final temple is shared both by Jewish leaders and the Freemasons. Yet the two groups disagree on exactly what the final temple would be. There is a common history here and a common longing. They'll never end up with the same temple. Jewish uh, wishes for the final temple really don't resemble what Masons want to have built on the Temple Mount, which is a replica of Solomon's Temple. With their mysterious rituals and secret practices, the Masons are often accused of intoxicating the world, making it drunk with ideas of a new age and a new world order, all of which are engineered toward the fulfillment of the new Atlantis envisioned by Sir Francis Bacon. Could it be that this is what lies behind the concept of a third and final temple? It, to me, makes perfect sense that the new Atlantis, as understood in the, in the Baconian tradition, involves the final temple. The spiritual headquarters, if you will, of the, new, of the new Atlantis. The idea of that temple is central to Freemasonry, the Knights Templar, the, and of this there is no doubt. They, they, they've all expressed it, uh, all these arcane societies have let it be known that this is really ultimately a central goal. They seem to all gravitate toward there being a a temple, a need for a temple, except Orthodox Muslims who say, no, we're the last religion. These buildings are fine, thank you very much. Become a Muslim and you can pray in them and hang out on the Temple Mount, which is not going to happen. So that leads to a pretty ugly likelihood. If people who want a temple get their way, there's going to be a, there's going to be a bloodbath there. Also, I believe it's spiritual because Satan has always desired God's place. That's why in Masonry you have Jebulon right there on the altar, Baal, the ruler of demons in the Masonic altar. And Masons are generally, obviously, you know, being deceived. However, right there on the Temple Mount in Israel, you have the Dome of the Rock and you have the Golden Dome, the Black Dome. And within these domes, you have statements right there on Israel's Temple Mount, statements that Allah is God and and, you know, Allah has no, or God has no son, and Muhammad's his prophet. A denial 
of the true God and his son, Jesus Christ. And again, that's what 1 John identifies as being the spirit of Antichrist, those that deny the Father and the Son, 1 John chapter 2. And that's a harbinger of the ultimate Antichrist to come, who's going to sit in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So isn't it interesting? Here we have Benjamin Krim speaking of a coming Maitreya, who will rule as the coming Imam Mahdi of Islam. Of course, that can, he can't really rule and there can't be world peace unless the Jews in his mind are annihilated. And by the way, according to Muslim teachings uh, in the Hadith, uh, you know, when the Imam Mahdi comes or when the Messiah comes, he will destroy uh, the Jews and the people of the cross. So all of this stuff, incredibly, I mean, it fits together just too well. But praise God, because from my perspective as a Christian, Jesus Christ said, when you see these things beginning to take place, lift up your head for redemption is drawing near. And I believe these are signs that, that Jesus Christ is coming again. And when he does come, he will defeat the Antichrist and every knee will bow and every tongue confess, including, including Benjamin Krim, including uh, the leaders of Iran and, and uh, Hezbollah and so forth. Whether it's in heaven or on earth or in hell, every knee will bow, declaring that Jesus Christ is Lord in the end. And what will all these things mean for the future destiny of America? According to David Ovison, it was Manley Hall who influenced the placement of 72 stones on the Great Pyramid of the Dollar Bill. Since the number 72 is said to be a magical number in the occult. It was also Hall who taught that the American Eagle was a cleverly disguised phoenix bird. In his writings, he documents this account from the first century AD. There is a certain bird which is called a phoenix and when the time of its dissolution draws near that it must die, it builds itself a nest. But as the flesh decays, a certain kind of worm is produced. According to this account, it is from this worm that the phoenix is reborn. This concept of a phoenix worm in its nest seems to be represented at the top of this column on a building found in Europe. But in Washington, D.C., up at the tops of the 72 columns of the National Archives building, we find nearly identical carvings, all perched beneath the throne of destiny itself. Could this somehow be a veiled reference to the secret destiny of America? Watching the strength of the American dollar decline, we consider America's founder, George Washington. Around his image on the face of the dollar is said to be an omega symbol, signifying the end. But what end? Many researchers have come to believe that the plan of these Luciferian societies is that like the Phoenix of old, the America that we know will ultimately be destroyed and that from her ashes will be born a new world order.